Good morning. I'm whispering because it's 6am and it's 6am because today I am filming part two of my definitive guide to the Ferrari Roma in which I'm going to talk to you about what this car is like to live with as a daily driver and whether it's worth considering as your first Ferrari, particularly if you're coming from an Aston Martin or a Jaguar. To find this out today, myself and my good friend Anthony from Sports and Touring are taking the car on a 300 mile road trip heading over to Gilks Garage Cafe in Kyneton where I've arranged a roads to meet of a whole bunch of petrol head friends. So, I'll see you there. So this is why I don't do much vlogging, because you can't really plan anything. My bright idea was that I'd turn up a little bit before 9 o'clock when Gilt's Garage Cafe opens and I'd be able to do my nice intro and then get everybody arriving at the meet. It would appear that my fans are better at turning up early than I am. So I arrived and the place was half full already. So what I thought I'd do is give you a walk around, show you some of the wonderful and amazing cars that my supporters have brought along. And then if I can, I'm going to ask a few of the good people here today on their opinion of the Roma that we've brought. So um, we'll start at the back and we'll walk out the front. Gilks, I absolutely love, by the way. It's a fifth generation garage, genuine old garage, was a Roots dealership. And they started way back when, over 100 years ago, shoeing horses. It, it's a proper family affair. So this is us, so this is boring, you don't need to see this. There's an RX-8 here, which is lovely. Do you like to see an RX-8? Behind it, we've got AIM again, in Renault Liquid Yellow, which I do love, brilliant color that. And the car park at the back, we've got a great variety of stuff too. So in a kind of whistle stop tour, we're gonna to talk you through some of it, and I'm luckily gonna get quite a bit wrong. So if you were here, and I've totally misidentified your car, I apologize. But if you were here also, thank you so much. We've got C250 with AMG badging, then, little Clio, 172. This Cupra has turned up with Finnish plates. Next to it, Rover 820i Vitesse that I've been offered for a review. Hey, Instagram as well, HPR underscore photo, check that out. Next to it, Rover P5B Coupe. And these are kind of cool and kind of weird because I've driven a P5B, the saloon, but the Coupe, still a four door, it's just slightly shapelier at the back. So I'm gonna get Anthony to thread himself through these cars now. Behind me, we have an MG, and I've got to get this right, whether it's an F or a TF, I'll never be forgiven. I think it's an F. Is it an F? It's an F. Right, that was lucky. Audi TT, of course. Then Merck CLA45, I do believe. Then we've got little Fiat, is that a Panda? I think it's a Panda. I, you know what? Yeah, it is 100 horsepower. I drove one of these, I actually liked it quite a bit. Next to that, we have a 370Z that belongs to a good friend of Anthony's, or at least, well, I mean, they, they've all got 370Z, so I just assume they're all good friends. That's, that's how it works, isn't it? In the corner, the coolest of Italian four-door saloons, the Maserati Quattroporte, an early example, which looks very, very nice. Next to it, lovely, lovely color for this BMW M2. Then we've got an M4, and next to that, 
a spicy mini. But we've got so many people turn up here today. Normally we just kind of take over this car park, but we've actually taken over a whole other one too. So we're gonna take you over there now. So behind us, we've got three liter Toyota Supra. Next to that, Ferrari 365. Next to that, Jaguar E-Type. And here we have a brace of sevens in various gorgeous colors. And I tell you what, today is the day to bring a seven out. Then next door, another lightweight icon, the Lotus Elise. Then next door to that, another seven. Then next door to that, a Renault Clio RS, like 200 or 220, I kind of lose track of it. And next to that, lest we not forget, the incredible Hyundai Veloster, which actually is the car that I reviewed, now in new ownership and still being enjoyed. We've got some minis turning up, which I think might or might not be something to do with us, but uh, always nice to see a classic mini about. And there's a whole car park over there. So here we have another Lotus Elise. This one, a series one with a Honda engine in the back. Bought apparently off the back of my review and happily spoke to the owner this morning and he's been having a great time with it. Next up, a car I really, really need to own one day. X150 generation Jaguar XKR. This one is the five liter. Oh, they're so good. I really, really want one. Behind that, another Jag F-Type. Then behind that, we've got a Saab Estate, which actually I think is also kind of cool. And we have a hot third generation Ford Focus RS. Love the shirt. And here, I think we're finally at the end of it. We've got a Suzuki Swift. I don't think the Dacia has actually anything to do with us. A couple of classic minis, we've got a Z4, an RCZ has just turned up, another TT, we've got a Clio, uh, we've got Alfa Romeo over there, 159 by the looks of it, GT86, uh, pu uh, pu all right, you're pointing at the Purple Tuscan. The purple Tuscan, I, that, that's a kind of bit of me. It's like a Capri, you know, car, I love that. 911 Clio 4S, Abarth, 124 Spider. So that's a roundup of all the cars that have come to the meet, and hopefully that proves I am fortunate enough to have a very diverse and eclectic mix of people that watch the channel. So, what will they think of Aroma? And I would like to take this opportunity to say a huge thank you to everybody who made my meet possible. From the team at Gilks to every single one of you who turned up. And of course, all of you who messaged me to say we'd love to have come, but unfortunately we couldn't. The good news is, if you're currently sat at home going, ah, oh, dang it, I didn't even know this was on and I wish I could have come, it looked like good fun. Fear not, because there will be plenty more opportunities. I run these meets in conjunction with Roadster, the social media app designed for petrol head types like us. I will be doing several of them over the summer, I did last year, and hopefully will again next year. Both the meets and the app are completely free. And even better, for iPhone users, there's now CarPlay functionality for the Roadster app too, meaning that you can have an even easier time of following your favorite routes, meeting up with friends, and all this other cool stuff us petrol heads like to do, particularly in the nice summer months. For more information on the Roadster app, please check out the links in the description down below, and I hope to see you all at a future meet. And as I may have already inferred, I did have an ulterior motive for bringing the Roma to the Gilks meet. Not only did I want to find out how the car performed on a long journey, I also wanted to get the opinion of the petrol head public on this car. And I began with the industry standard, and all important for a Ferrari, lift the bonnet and see how quickly a crowd can form test, where the Roma passed with flying colours. It didn't take all that long for people to gather around and marvel how even in this day and age with increased safety regulation, electric electrification and just boring engine bays. This is still a work of art. You'll note how far back in the bay the Roma's engine is and how small and compact it looks. That almost certainly contributes to its sharp, agile and very entertaining handling, which if you want to know more about, please watch part one of this review if you haven't already. And then we asked people for their opinion on both the exterior and interior of the Roma. And I'm happy to report that it would appear Ferrari have absolutely nailed their brief of creating an understated yet elegant car that is a tribute to the Grand Tourers of the 1960s. People love the Roma. Though I should point out, if you are thinking of buying this car to be subtle and go unnoticed, it's not going to work. Where you could drive through the middle of London in a 911 GT3 and barely get even a slight glance, 
this does turn heads, people still know it's something very special. Maybe it's the combination of this gorgeous paint colour that did attract many positive comments, the rather prominent wing shields, and the fact it is a Ferrari. The Roma still stands out. People look at it and generally speaking, they love it. The entire time that I've had this car, I haven't received a single negative comment. And I may even have to take back some of my words about the way that it sounds, because though from inside, it's not the most exciting, from outside, it does still give you the tone of a proper flat plane crank V8 Ferrari. Just slightly muted, but still distinctive. And that to me fits the brief of this car perfectly. It was, however, perhaps surprisingly, the interior which garnered the most acclaim. And it's for that reason exactly that I was so keen to get other people to sit in this car and give me their honest, unfiltered feedback. Because you see, people like myself are very fortunate. I get to sit in stuff like this, nice new Ferraris, all the time. And so you can become sometimes a little overly critical. I said that this video was designed to talk to the people that maybe have never had a Ferrari of any type before. Maybe you've got an F-Type, an XKR, an Aston Martin or something like that. And they're thinking of upgrading to something like this. Well, based on the feedback of all the people that I had sit in this, including some who'd never been in a Ferrari before, I was told it felt every bit as special as you want a Ferrari to be, with some noting in particular that it's Ferrari who seemed to do interiors just a little bit better than everybody else. The centre screen, I think, remained the most controversial piece of the whole interior, but the overall effect and the quality of materials, except the headlining, people really did like. And as an added bonus, we even managed to correct another thing that I said in part one, where I said you'd never ever get four adults in here. I was wrong, because we did. And they didn't actually look anywhere near as crushed in there as when myself and three friends tried to fit ourselves in Ben's Dad B9. And so I think it's fair to say that amongst my petrol head friends and audience, the Roma is a smash hit. I don't think I encountered a single person who said, given the chance, that they wouldn't have one. And um, I think I'm with them on that. But I do want to also talk to you about what it's been like to live with this week, having now done about 600 miles. In many ways, the Roma really is the most difficult car in the entire lineup for Ferrari to have gotten right. Because you see, when it comes to something like a 296, a supercar, it's actually fairly simple. All you've got to do is make a car that puts a smile on people's faces. And I know it's a little bit more complicated than that. Ferrari will have goals for efficiency, goals for performance, goals for aerodynamics, all that sort of stuff. But when it comes down to it, in terms of what's going to make people buy, I think the smile on the face is really all that matters. To prove that point, over the last few days, I have seen three Lamborghini Aventador S and not a single McLaren GT. When you consider the fact that the McLaren GT has a bigger boot, is more comfortable, more usable, more efficient, it is miserably a better car, probably in the real world much quicker too. But that doesn't matter to a supercar buyer. The Aventador is full of theatre. It's a terrible car and a brilliant supercar. The Roma, though, is a GT. It is supposed to be something you can use every single day. And so this week, I've done all the things with it that you wouldn't really think people do with a Ferrari. I've taken it to the shops, where it's been really good. In fact, on day one, I took it into a multi-story car park, and it did pretty darn well, which is impressive when you consider this car doesn't have suspension lift because you can't get it on the Roma. That's bold, but it does well. The suspension in comfort mode, in bumpy road, is genuinely very comfortable. It's got an edge of firmness. You can feel there's a tautness to the whole thing at all times, but push hard and it really, really flows to the point where if you are pressing on, actually comfort or bumpy road mode is a little bit too soft. And that's exactly how it should be. We got, as already mentioned, four real full-grown adults in this car, which is brilliant. The economy of it, I'm sure, is not fantastic, but in terms of range, I've done just over 350 miles to a tank, and I'm currently driving to a fuel station, which I'm going to need fairly soon. 
in automatic mode, the new 8-speed gearbox is better than any other Ferraris I've experienced thus far. The 7-speed and the F12 in particular around town can get itself in a little bit of a bind, can really get itself confused, but this seems more of the time to know what it wants to do. And yet, when you're on it, it's even faster, even more capable. The paddles here I really, really love, as did everybody who hopped into the car the other day. It's a touch point that I think is very important to get right, and here Ferrari have. It hasn't been all sunshine and roses though, and of course I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't mention that. The main issue I've had with the Roma all week has been error messages. Ferraris are prone to them, but for some reason this particular Roma has been worse than any other Ferrari I have ever experienced. Every single day, barring today actually, that I've got into it, it's given me an electrical failure warning. Except today where it gave me a low beam failure warning, ADAS failure warnings, the dash didn't light up for half a minute, and it likely did that because when I got into it, rather than turning the ignition on, waiting an arbitrary five or six seconds, and then hitting the start button again to fire the engine up, I just got in and pressed the start button to turn the engine on. In a Ferrari, that's a no-no. And if you are coming from a Jaguar or an Aston Martin, apparently you do still have to put up with some Ferrari quirks. And I know that's going to put people off. I know there will be people out there who would simply not accept any kind of error message in a £230,000 car. The simple fact is, nothing I think has actually gone wrong with the car this week, and it's almost certainly related to a slight low voltage issue, maybe the battery needs replacement, or it's just had a particularly hard life because as a press car, you'll always be doing silly things with it, leaving the ignition on for a while and leaving it unlocked and doing all sorts of stuff, and it's never failed to start or even made me think it's going to fail to start. But getting an error message when you turn a car on is never a nice thing, and I really wish Ferrari would maybe just work out a way of making the car a little bit more intelligent. If it's just a temporary blip, or maybe just change the error message to say, the sky is falling, because Ferraris do like to do that on occasion, you just get used to it. The satellite navigation is also fairly useless. This car didn't even recognize roads that I know were built before the Roma went into production. And ordinarily, that wouldn't bother me were it not for the fact that the car still does not have Android Auto. A ridiculous oversight, if you ask me, and an annoyance that I think Ferrari really need to deal with. They've made strides, they really have. You now get wireless Apple CarPlay as standard, but uh, Android Auto, I think, really does need to join it soon on account of the fact this is 2023. Come on now, Ferrari, I know you can do it. But that aside, the Roma has been a sensational companion. Even when you're doing the boring stuff, I'm following farm machinery right now, doing 27 mile an hour, and the car feels special. The view out the front is spectacular, highly reminiscent of that in the 550. And if you're the sort of person that would like a 550 but doesn't want to put up with classic Ferrari ownership and maintenance, and I, and I get that, it, it is a pain. You know, I know that. And you don't want something as showy or flashy as an F12 or an 812. This is a wonderful compromise. If you need back seats, this is a wonderful compromise. If you would have had a Portofino or Portofino M or California or California T, were it not for the fact they're a convertible, the Roma is the car to have. I'm going to be very keen to see how the new Aston Martin DB12 is priced because on paper that performs similarly to this, has more power but almost certainly more weight. It's got a new revised interior which I think really can take the fight to Ferrari. The old one was just way, way short of the mark, but dynamically I think it's going to have to be something pretty special to match up to this. My previous experience of the DB11 tells me that as a cruiser it's a fine thing and the steering in them is very, very good, but as a sports car the Roma is superb. That is the area I think where this really will lift itself above the Aston Martin, but until I've tried one I couldn't say. And I suppose in some ways you could say that the V8 Vantage is a more apt comparison because it's the more overtly sporting car, but it doesn't have back seats, nor does an F-Type. And at my meet I had F-Type and X-Car owners sit in this and they all said it does feel a cut above the Jag. 
and of course it does feel a cut above the V8 Vantage, but I expect that's going to be revised fairly soon too. Even compared to everybody's favourite daily drivable usable sports car, the 911, the Roma really is a cut above. I think it's more exciting, more engaging to drive on the limit. It's a little bit more practical, certainly in terms of the back seats, and even better, when you are on the motorway, it's quite a bit quieter too compared to the likes of, say, the F12 or A12. It also feels just that little bit less intimidating. You sit into an F12 and you go, oh my, there is a lot of bonnet out the front. Even I do that and I've had it for over a year, but this, I feel like I can just hop into it and go. While I absolutely appreciate the theatre of the F12, and that's what it's all about, there is also a lot to be said for a car which enables you to just hop in and go with very little forethought or planning. Every single day I've had this car on the driveway, I have used it almost exclusively. In fact, the only time I drove anything else was when Anthony and I were doing some drive-bys of the 430 Scuderia. And though that car looks and sounds fantastic, because it is so loud, I mean, it's really loud, that car, I'm awfully self-conscious when I'm filming with it. This, though, is just that little bit calmer, just that little bit quieter. And at times like now, it's uh, getting close to eight o'clock. I just don't really worry quite so much. I know I'm not disturbing quite so many people, yet I'm still having fun in here. And that, I think, really is what the Roma is all about. It's understated, it's elegant, it's usable, it's practical, as Ferraris go. But crucially, it is still a Ferrari. Show it a B-road, it will go like stink and put a smile on the face of yourself and hopefully just about anybody else who sees you as well other than Mrs. Miggins, who lives on the corner, who hates all things fast. Sure, for a half-hour blast, something like the F430 Spider that I drove last week would be better. And if you're going to use the back seats more of the time, the likes of an FF or a Lusso might suit your needs more. This is to say nothing of the incoming Pura Sangue, but that exists at a wholly different price point. I'm not sure you can actually order one of those at the minute if you haven't already got your name down. But the Roma kind of has it all. And I think of all the Ferrari press cars that I've had, this is probably the one that if they called me and said, uh, do you want to hold on to it for a little bit longer, do another thousand miles, I would say, yes, please. Because I'm really, really going to miss this. I always kind of admired the Rome, or I did enjoy it in Italy, but let's face it, you get flown out to Italy, you're on a Ferrari press launch and all that jazz, you've got some nice weather, you've got the roads to yourself, and it's a very, very special event, you're probably going to fall for the car. Try and be as analytical and as clinical as you might be. You're on unfamiliar roads, in an unfamiliar country, in an unfamiliar car. There's only so much you're ever going to learn. But here and now, on my roads and on my terms, I've fallen for this car. I really have. I even, and I'm going to say this quietly, I quite like looking at its bum. <laughs> so, on that note, I've got about another hour where I can actually use this car before it has to go back. So if you don't mind, I'm going to enjoy myself, I think. And I want to say a huge thank you to Ferrari for lending it to me, and of course, to everybody who attended my meet at Gilts, and all of you that have watched the videos. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, and subscribe if you haven't already. We'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.